Have you thought about what operating system your car's center console is running? Has anybody ever thought about that? Because it's actually kind of a big deal, right? Hello everybody. I'm going to start the video off with an absolutely ludicrous premise. The premise is, I genuinely believe that if you try and learn how your toaster works, you will become a better software developer. You might be thinking, Hoff, that is so silly. How does knowing how my toaster works make me a better software developer? I'm going to try and convince you of that in this video, and I think that by the end you'll agree with me. So first thing I want to start off with, right, is replace toaster with any ubiquitous day-to-day -day digital appliance, okay? So let's not discriminate against microwaves or ovens or even your car's center console, okay? I'm talking about any digital appliance that not just you as a you know, STEM major or computer engineer or software developer, but normal people, normal people use every single day, like these uh, generic kitchen appliances. Okay, replace toaster with that, because what I'm referring to is going about your day-to-day -day life and seeing the code around you, okay? This is a really interesting thing, and this is why I put a picture of uh, Neo from The Matrix in the thumbnail, because Pretty much what he can do as he goes about his life in the matrix is he can see the code that makes up the matrix. So here's the thing, guys. We're living in the digital era where we have digital devices around us every day. It's absolutely inescapable. But you know, every time you look at a digital device like a microwave or a toaster or, you know, I don't know, your computer keyboard or something like that, some guy or girl at a company had to sit down and write the code that runs that thing. So the, the microwave, right? Some person had to sit down and write the code that handles user inputs. You know, when you're pressing the plus, plus, plus to make your microwave go for longer, or if you are, you know, when you do the timing for actually counting that down and then activating the motor that, that rotates the little plate. Someone had to program that. Looks like it's a uh, Sunbeam Maestro toaster. Definitely not sponsored, okay? But this is the toaster that I have, and I'm going to try and prove my point to you, okay? So, looking at this toaster, how does this thing work? The first thing we notice is there's this little display down here, all right, with a bunch of buttons on it. And obviously, my background, as you know, is as an embedded systems engineer, so I've made a bunch of these similar kinds of things before. If I push this button, the little number goes up and that corresponds to a change in the time. So what I think is happening in the background here is, uh, you know, uh, if you're not familiar with how electronic buttons work, essentially you are connecting a signal. Usually I've seen it as a high signal and the button is like a switch. And when you press the button, it connects it to ground. So if you have a microcontroller that is reading that on something like a GPIO pin, once it notices that the GPIO pin has changed state, it's gone from high to low or from low to high, that corresponds to a button press. More interestingly, if I hold the button, let's say I push it and I don't release it, you can see it instantly goes up. So what that tells me is that the interrupt or the polling for however this button works is only on the first edge of that change. And you, as a software engineer, you have the capability to understand that code and understand how these things that people use every day actually work, or at least you can conceptualize it. And this is a thing that seems like magic to most ordinary people. Okay, I've, I would bet that you've had this sort of experience before in your own life when you've helped somebody. I know, you know, when I've helped friends or relatives or sometimes, you know, people at work, I bet you've had this experience too, where you help them understand something about their computer or about their digital device and they just look at you like you're a complete magician. I've had that a couple times. I bet you have as well. So why not take that one step further? That's my question. Most of you guys have probably completed software products before, or contributed or written code, or you've written a, a personal project from start to finish, okay? Why not take that a bit further? Here's my question. How many of you, and I want to hear this in the comments, how many of you have genuinely looked at your microwave or your toaster and genuinely thought about how that might work? Because like I said before, someone had to code it. Someone had, someone just like you at their job had to write the code that runs that digital appliance. Have you thought about how they might have done it? 
what it's probably doing right now is it's in a sort of initial state. So how I would model a microwave is kind of like a state machine, okay? So we've got this initial state where it's looking for user input. It's deciding how to run the program. You've got different options here that you can choose, you know, that probably determine different uh, running settings for the, for the program. Um, but then once you press start, you close the door and press start. It's also probably got an open state, you know, like a door open or door closed state. And different state changes will be valid in different states. So when the door is open, it's probably not a valid state for me to go ahead and press start. But if I close the door, the start becomes a valid state change and I can just go ahead and press it. And when I press it and it starts spinning the tray, it probably goes into a running state from which stop is a valid exit condition. The code written by your kin is everywhere. And if you think about how it works, what it does for you is it trains your brain to start thinking about how to begin software products just all the time. Do you know what I mean? Like if you look at digital appliances that you encounter every single day, and every time you look at that or you interact with it, you think about how somebody might have written that code, what you're actually doing is giving yourself free personal project training. Okay, maybe let me say this a different way. When you start writing a project, like a software project, you have to sit down, conceptualize how it's going to work, and then start building it out. What you're doing when you look at these daily life interaction things with maybe your microwave or your car center console, right? What you're doing is training your brain into thinking about software architecture every single day. And you're thinking, how would I actually build this? How did the person who wrote this initially uh, make it work? Um, and, and these sorts of questions. Here's another question for you. Have you thought about what operating system your car's center console is running? Has anybody ever thought about that? Because it's actually kind of a big deal, right? Like, cars these days have very fancy center consoles. You know, um, they've got all the little displays and it's all touchscreen and you can click on this and you can click on that and you can click on the other thing. So what operating system is that? It's got to be running something, okay? Um, it's probably running, you know, I when I think about this, I think, well, it's probably running some kind of embedded Linux or maybe it's running a BSD derivative if they don't want to release the source code. Um, and then I took it one step further. I had no idea. How does the car center console communicate with the different parts of the car? So I looked it up and it turns out it uses this thing called CAN bus, which is very common for vehicles. So thinking about this, you know, I filled out all of the parts I knew how to do. I know how to do an embedded system with touchscreens. I know how to do the graphics. I know how to do um, uh, the putting the embedded operating system on there. I don't know how it communicates, so let me find out. But what I've done there is I've conceptualized mostly about how that car center console is going to work, and then I've just filled in the blanks. And if you think about it, that is exactly what you do when you start a software project of your own. And this is my whole point, guys. My whole point is that if you look at the world around you and you try and see the code as much as you can, it will help you when you go and start your own software projects because you've been training your brain this whole time, literally for free, whenever you interact with these, uh, with these electronic devices. You've been training your brain to think about how to start a software project. Isn't that crazy? And it's even more fun. It gets to become a, a bit of a game after a point, you know? It's, it gets a, like a lot of fun. You look at an everyday appliance and it's a bit of a puzzle. It's like, yeah how would that work? And the important thing is to think about how would I implement that? How would you implement that? Because everybody's mind works differently when it comes to code, you know? There's a lot of ways to do the same thing. Some better, some worse, some it doesn't matter, you know? It's both equally fine. But everybody's mind works differently. So the important question to ask yourself is how would you write that code? because that's what's actually going to help you when you start your own software projects. So look at how your toaster works. Someone had to program that. What if that person was you? That's my question, guys. So essentially what you're doing is you're training your brain on all of these things that you see in your daily life, 
and you're training it on software architecture. <laughs> and over time, you get to be able to see the code around you. You see the code just like Neo from the Matrix. You look at everyday objects and you're like, I know exactly how someone would probably have done that.